Hello, I'm the Game Professor, and welcome to the fourth episode of Games Is Lit 101's Deep Dive into The World Ends With You. Over the course of the last three videos, we've discussed the first two-thirds of the game and its use of metaphor in its mechanics. If you haven't already, I highly recommend going back and starting with those videos, because this one is going to be referencing and building on information contained in them. The World Ends With You has a lot of things going on in its story. The main plot is complex enough, especially once we get into the secret reports and what was going on behind the scenes, but interwoven through the game is a series of side stories that both factor into the main story and form their own little examinations of the game's ideas. So today, we're gonna go over them a bit. So then, let's see what's going on in the peripheries of The World Ends With You, and how these goings-on contribute to the story's overall intent. Unreal, bro! Mina and I are two recurring characters who show up throughout The World Ends With You, but their thematic relevance mostly stands in an early moment where a misunderstanding between them is used to illustrate some of the complications and values of friendship to a still rather disenchanted Neku. The mission for that day is for Neku and Shiki to erase the noise from Spain Hill, but no matter how many they fight, there are still more. Mina and I are embroiled in conflict over Makoto, a lovable and misguided dork we'll be talking about in a bit. Basically, Ai has a crush on Makoto, and Mina knows this, but she had been talking to Makoto earlier and showed distinct interest in getting tickets for the Tin Pin Slam-Off with him. Ai confronts Mina by using Reaper Creeper to try and get the truth out of her, and we can use the game to either play into her accusations or deny them. But whether Ai corners Mina or we try to say she's wrong, Mina eventually fesses up and gives the Slam-Off tickets to Ai, as that was the plan all along. She had figured out what Makoto wanted and bought two tickets so Ai could take him. So basically, it was all a misunderstanding. The story itself is fairly simple, the kind of thing you might expect to see on a kid's show trying to get a simple moral across in the span of 24 minutes. But since it's part of a larger overall story, we do have a little bit more that we can take away from it than we might otherwise have. Taken on its own terms, this story is primarily about trust and communication. If I had given her friend the benefit of the doubt, this could have gone a lot smoother, and if she had actually talked to her instead of passive-aggressively using Reaper Creeper to pull the truth out of her, it might have gone like Mina planned and resulted in a nice surprise. This message about trusting and honestly talking with our friends is a good one, and while the whole it was all a misunderstanding thing is often a lazy trope used to generate conflict with a simple resolution, it's refreshing to see a story, however small, that actually places the responsibility for that misunderstanding at the feet of the character who jumped to conclusions. In the larger context of the story, it illustrates the differences between how Neku and Shiki view relationships. Shiki sees two friends butting heads and coming out the other side of the argument with a better understanding of each other and a stronger, more trusting bond. Neku sees it as an inconvenience for both Mina and I. This is also where he makes his comment about compromise, indicating that he was probably reading the situation as Mina actually liking Makoto, but giving her tickets to I under pressure to maintain the friendship. And even if not, this was clearly an unpleasant experience for both of them. Why bother with something that would bring about such an argument in the first place? Shiki understood the event with a primary emphasis on the friendship, and Neku viewed it with an emphasis on the self-interest of Mina and I. There's also one other small note from this story I didn't mention in the first video. When I first suggests using Reaper Creeper to get the truth out of Mina, we don't yet know that Mina's interaction with Makoto was actually for Ai's benefit, and Shiki and Neku disagree on whether they should indicate the truth, as we understand it at the time, or lie so Ai won't find out about her friend's apparent betrayal. After the truth comes out, Neku still says he doesn't see the point of a relationship based on lies, but Shiki sees things differently. You don't lie to make friends, I agree, that wouldn't be right. But sometimes you need to tell a fib because you are friends. Not all secrets are bad secrets. That in and of itself is of course kind of a controversial thing to say, but the point here is a statement about trust and an observation about authenticity in relationships. That a real friendship is about more than just absolute constant honesty, because both parties will always have each other's best interests at heart. It's the kind of thing that someone like Neku who doesn't really understand what friendship is or how it works might not recognize at face value. It establishes that relationships are a little more complicated than Neku is making them out to be, both in positive and negative ways, which is of course the first step to realizing that he's wrong to write them off as easily as he does. After this, Mina and I show up in a few different contexts, like in line at Shadow Ramen, talking to Eri about Shiki, talking about how Makoto has changed in week two, and of course... Well, we're getting ahead of ourselves there. But that first little story is the main part where they really have bearing on the game's overall message. Which means now it's time to talk about one of the game's most ubiquitous side characters from the RG, and its biggest side story. 
When we first meet Makoto, he's just some kid who's stuck in a job marketing pins, which he knows nothing about. Later in week one, he's put in charge of marketing a new pin, that red player pin designed by Cat. He clearly doesn't know how to go about it, and only manages to succeed with our help. First by indicating when he can use some of his terrible catchphrases, like, come get some hot stuff, and unreal bro, when they'll actually work on someone, then by fighting with the pin so it catches on as a trend. Makoto is basically just some poor schmuck with a desk job who's tasked with promoting something he's unfamiliar with in ways he doesn't understand. He's not particularly ambitious, but he is dedicated, and his self-esteem is clearly tied rather strongly to his performance in his job. Helping him is literally the mission for the day, to make the pin popular enough to dominate the view at Scramble Crossing when the ad plays on the big screen at 10-4. But aside from that, helping is just the right thing to do. If I point out all the scenarios where the game equates helping others with helping yourself, we're gonna be here all day, so I'm just gonna assume you can recognize that when you see it. But in week two, we see the dangers of tying one's self-esteem to one's success. In short, Makoto has let it go to his head. And he's opened up a new ramen shop, Shadow Ramen, in Dogenzaka, right down the street from the established Ramen Don restaurant. When Neku and Joshua show up, the line for Shadow Ramen goes out the door and down the street, and Makoto is there handing out those red player pins to everyone who's waiting. Neku and Joshua talk to some of the people in the restaurant, and it becomes clear that everyone is here because the place is popular, not necessarily because they actually want the ramen. The cooks sing as they prepare the food, so it's this big spectacle, and it's just a new popular place that they could all post food pics from on Instagram, if Instagram existed in 2007. Turns out, part of the reason for that is a recommendation from A.G. O.G., the Prince of Ennui, whose blog, F Everything, gets 100,000 hits a day. Because if you're not sure if a game was made in the relatively early days of the internet, a good way to tell is if one of the characters got actually real-life famous with a blog. For what it's worth, when the prince Fs something that's actually him saying it's fabulous and it makes everyone excited, it's a clever little wordplay thing, but anyway, Ramen Don, just down the street, has the best ramen around, but the place is empty. Neku doesn't understand why that is, and regards the people at Shadow Ramen as shallow for chasing trends and experiences over actual good food, and he and Joshua have a good view of their this-is-why-we-can't-understand-people conversations in this segment. But we eventually find out that Makoto paid the prince to run a pre-written blog post recommending Shadow Ramen, and the prince's actual opinion of the place isn't that high. Convicted by his sense of integrity, the prince eventually changes the post to reflect his actual opinion, and finds solace in the simplicity of Ramen Don's lovingly crafted ramen, and the presence of its owner, Ken Doi, who apparently worked for his family a long time ago under the name Sebastian. This sidetrack does include a number of conversations about relationships and understanding people, but we covered that angle in the last video. This whole warring ramen shops thing is mostly focused on a supporting theme of The World Ends With You, expression through art. It's a pretty logical supporting theme for the game. A good portion of it is about how and why we express ourselves and present ourselves to others. So to talk about art in that context makes a good deal of sense, and manages to expand the breadth of the game's themes while also backing up its major points. We saw a bit of it in Week 2 in general, with the introduction of Cat, his ideology, his identity, and the examination of his aesthetic and motto. We see someone who creates art that inspires others, we see Neku taking that inspiration to support his broken worldview, and we see Cat himself try to set Neku straight on what it actually means. And of course, this relates to Shiki's sewing in Week 1, and the general mechanics that utilize self-expression through one's appearance to project an image of yourself into Shibuya and affect the city's landscape of trends and ideas. But this whole ramen adventure is when the game arguably gives it to us most clearly. We see four major instances of expression in this side story. Makoto, with his new ramen shop that's tailored to get people talking and make money, the customers of Shadow Ramen, who are chasing the popular thing so they have something cool to show their friends, the prince, with his blog that's been co-opted by corporate interests, and Ken Doi, who's just making ramen the way he loves, but is now scrambling to find something fresh to bring people in so he can keep doing it. Four instances of expression, all at various places on the spectrum of intent and motivation. As far as Makoto is concerned, the game is pretty clearly setting this up as a low point for his character. He's been seduced by success, and is now basing all of his decisions on what he thinks is going to continue that streak. It's worth briefly noting that this arc is where the game makes its one mention of capitalism, and seems to equate capitalism with the pursuit of wealth and success over authenticity and connection. Not the main point of the game by a long shot, but an interesting discussion could be had about how the values of the world ends with you clash or harmonize with various political, social, or economic systems. Makoto is partially motivated by money, of course, but remember how I said his self-esteem was clearly tied to his success at his job? 
That factors into this too. Makoto values himself more when he's successful at something, so he chases more success in order to continue feeling better about himself. He's based his self-esteem not on what he creates or the pride he takes in his work, but in how successful it is with other people. So he tries to create something that's tailor-made to get people talking, and manipulates trendsetters to make it catch on. It doesn't come from a place of expression, really, but of trying to match what other people have already expressed, and using those people to make it appealing. It's self-expression as a cynical pursuit of fame. The people outside Shadow Ramen are using this experience to express themselves, but it has little to do with their own preferences and ideas, and more to do with getting on a bandwagon. They're here because this place is popular, and they want to tell others they've been there. It's a conversation piece, Joshua says. People are always scrounging for something to talk about. I came, I waited, I slurped. They're after a story, not a meal. And so these people are expressing themselves through an experience they sought after. But as we see when we encounter Mina, it's not even necessarily an experience that speaks to them. It's just something they feel they should do, and they use it to elevate their status as a trending person. It's self-expression as a cynical pursuit of status and popularity. The Prince is on the verge of a similar place, having given Makoto's marketing strategy direct access to his blog. He's essentially sold out, so to speak. His blog is no longer a source of his own expression, but a marketing tool to be sold and used to turn a profit for others. But this bothers him, and when he decides to change the blog post to his actual thoughts on Shadow Ramen instead of Makoto's prepared statement, he says, I write my own blog. I list my own thoughts, my own feelings, the ramen I'd actually like to eat. Ultimately, he takes ownership of his own expression. It's self-expression as, well, simply put, expression of the self. Then we have Ken Doi, the proprietor of Ramen Don and once cook for the prince's household. He feels pressure to succumb to the pursuit of success as well, and he is in a legitimately tough spot as his business was threatened by the shiny, trendy new Shadow Ramen. He tries some new things, which all turn out excellent, but ultimately the thing that really saves him is the production of simple, lovingly made ramen served to the prince. A store isn't good because people talk about it, says the prince. It's the product, the taste. People talk about a store because it's good. There's love in Sebastian's soup, love for the people eating it. That's the sort of ramen I want other people to know about. And after all this, Ken himself realizes, those new experiments were all just me trying to get in on the show. I forgot the important part, the smile on a satisfied customer when they're done eating. My job is making ramen that makes people happy. Ken Doi makes ramen not for success, not even for himself, but for other people. It's self-expression as expression of love. The first two examples, Makoto and the customers of Shadow Ramen, are giving in to what the game is essentially portraying as a, a kind of anti-self-expression. It's, it's almost self-expression in reverse. Instead of giving an honest portrayal of who they are, they're shaping themselves with these outside forces based on what they think they're supposed to look like. This, in turn, makes it difficult to form true relationships with others, whether interpersonal ones, like Makoto and the Prince, or even parasocial ones, like the Prince and his followers. The Prince is not increasing his connection to the people who follow his blog by allowing others to dictate what he says on it, and his followers sure aren't going to be making any intense connections with other people by bragging about something they don't even actually care about on a personal level. Makoto, for that matter, is not going to be finding any deep relationships based on his wealth or success or popularity. This is is all expression, but it's false expression. We even find out in a conversation between Mina and Ai that Makoto faded away from his budding relationship with Ai because of all this. He gave up a real connection to pursue a ton of superficial ones. Compare all of this to the way the game talks about Cat. Cat's art speaks to Neku on a personal level, and to an extent, to understand Cat's work and Neku's takeaway from it is to understand Neku on a deeper, more personal level. Or compare it to the way the game talks about Ramen. Ken Doi's ramen is said to be made with love, and to mean something beyond the simple satiation of hunger or enjoyment of flavor. And most importantly, it's more specifically not love for ramen, but love for the people eating it. It speaks to his care for others, and other people feel that through his creations. To eat his ramen is, on some level, to connect with him personally. Or perhaps even more poignantly, compare it to what Makoto's old boss eventually says to him in week three after all this is said and done. Do you remember when you first started with me? On your first day, you had this twinkle in your eye, and you said, I want my customers to be happy. The you I knew first, he didn't need fancy clothes to be cool. I think you need to search back and ask that person where you should go from here. This whole ramen story is a pretty long and winding road to what essentially amounts to be true to yourself, but it's important nonetheless because 
this idea of honesty and integrity and self-expression is pretty important to the game's themes about connecting with other people, and it extends those themes not only to your actions and relationships, but to the things that you create for yourself and for others. But it acknowledges that that can sometimes be very difficult as well. After the whole ramen thing is over and done with, Joshua theorizes that all of this happened in the first place simply because of people trying to understand each other. Maybe everyone in Shibuya is here searching, struggling for a peek into their neighbors' worlds. When those neighbors change, they get scared, feel they have to change themselves, even what makes them who they are. In a way, this is all just still an attempt to understand people. For whatever reasons, be it greed, success, love, popularity, it's all just people trying to better understand one another. But the reasons why we're doing that affect how that expression turns out and how it affects other people. This might seem like a weird thing to spend such a huge chunk of this video on, but this is the most concentrated moment of the game's commentary on creativity. Over the course of the game, creativity is utilized in cooking, junk heaps, graffiti art, music, clothing, and even magical afterlife pin powers. But this moment is where all of that scattered commentary is brought into better focus. Minami Moto claims that his junk heaps are a perfectly calculated form of art and that the world lacks any beauty. He's also said multiple times in the game to be a loner who doesn't cooperate well with others, as evidenced by the whole bit where he just stops giving out missions and disappears to plan out his own thing halfway into his game. Minami Moto creates, but he creates using rigid systems and only for himself. We don't know much about Kat's motivations for creating, but we do know that his philosophy, to enjoy every moment with all you've got, is meant to reflect the value of actively expanding your world through others. His art isn't about isolation, as Neku once believed, but it exists to inspire people to connect with each other. Shiki sews, but it's more than just a personally fulfilling hobby, it's a major element in how she bonds with Eri, and she's seen caring about how fashion applies to other people too, not just to her. Ken Doi's ramen is made to show love to people who eat it. Triple Seven's music is made as a cooperative exploration of the relationship between him and his friends. Art, and self-expression as a whole, isn't meant to be a selfish experience, according to The World Ends With You, but a positive interaction between the artist and the people experiencing their art, a communion between people rather than a pursuit of trends at the exclusion of the humanity behind them. It's expression for the benefit of others, not just for their attention. And I think that's a pretty good lesson for the game to impart to us. You might even say it's totally gnarly! Yeah. In week one, we meet a reaper called Triple Seven, who leads a band in the RG called Death March, along with two other reapers, and also their very forgetful RG human tech. Triple Seven shows up on occasion throughout the game, not really giving Neku much trouble for the most part, but in week two, he has a problem we have to solve. Someone stole his band's mic. Apparently, this mic has wings on it, like reapers, and has great personal significance to the band. Neku and Joshua are tasked with figuring out what happened and where it is. Now frankly, how all this goes is convoluted enough that it would be a colossal waste of our time to actually summarize it all in detail, but in short, all of this happens in the first place because the three of them are not kindly, honestly, and openly communicating with each other. BJ wanted to try his hand at singing and was fighting with Triple Seven over the privilege. Inefficient communication is what started the whole thing. It was exacerbated when Tenho decided the best way to stop the infighting was to remove the mic as a factor rather than trying to help them sort it out by talking to them or acting as a mediator. He misdiagnosed the issue as revolving around the mic or even the act of singing rather than BJ wanting to branch out and feel more relevant to the group and Triple Seven being hesitant to share that element of fame. So of course, when the mic disappeared, the tension between BJ and Triple Seven just got worse, because adding tension into an already tense situation instead of dealing with the actual problem is never a good idea. Then the mic ended up found by an egomaniacal madman who doesn't care what others think, and once Neku and Joshua force the truth out and get them all to understand each other and reconcile, the band all goes diving into the junk heaps to try and find the mic. Sorting through their issues immediately inspired them to work together towards something they all value like old times. It's short, simple, silly, and pretty definitely filler to some degree, but it's thematically relevant filler. For all this game is about, the importance of clear communication and effective conflict resolution in relationships is ever-present but never really gets the spotlight, so it's nice to see these things highlighted for even just this brief period of time.
There are a number of other characters in The World Ends With You that don't contribute in a huge way to the game's overall meaning and don't really have a big enough role to talk about in detail, but I think are still worth mentioning, so I'm just gonna go through a few of them here real quick. Makoto's boss is never given a name, but we see him on occasion throughout the game, usually in conjunction with Reaper Creeper. He seems to rely on it for a lot of his decisions, even asking it for advice when Makoto expresses his woes about his regrets and failings as a businessman. How this whole thing turns out depends on the player's choices, but the happiest outcome happens when we actually refuse to manipulate the Reaper Creeper board, leaving the boss to talk to Makoto from his own heart, which is when he tells him the story we talked about earlier. Afterwards, he decides that Reaper Creeper is no substitute for his own judgment and decision making. It's a simple little character arc where we help someone realize that they can be self-sufficient, and it puts a nice little addendum on the game's claims about allowing others to have a hand in shaping your worldview by pointing out that your own experiences and perspective can also provide that enrichment to others. Uzuki and Karia show up constantly throughout the game, so they're worth mentioning. They're mostly used for exposition and moving the plot forward, and don't necessarily illustrate any major thematic points, but they do play off each other really well and are fun villains to have around. I don't really have much to say about them, they just show up enough that it seems like it'd be weird not to mention them at all. Sota and Nao are also worth talking about here. Their purpose in the story was mostly explained in the previous video, but since we're talking about all the side characters here, it's worth noting that Sota and Nao are very intentionally written. They're exactly what Neku would hate. Two people who openly depend on one another and come across as kind of stereotypical, trend-chasing airheads. Now's dialogue in particular is written to invoke a kind of valley girl stereotype, which could just be a localization decision but was probably translated as an approximation of how she was written in the original Japanese. Point being, they're presented to be exactly the kinds of people Neku would judge as vapid, useless, and entirely unnecessary to have in his own life. But they're also, pretty much without competition, the healthiest relationship in the entire game. They clearly care about one another, they have a solid grasp on what that commitment requires of them, and they gladly give of themselves for the sake of each other and others. I appreciate that we have some characters here to display what a healthy relationship looks like, and it's a testament to what Neku deprives himself of by judging everyone so immediately and harshly. It's very much on purpose that a couple Neku would have hated in week one end up encouraging him and inspiring some of his greatest change in week two. The three game masters deserve a mention too, because each of them involves, to some degree, a mystery directed form of creativity. Creepy Food Reaper makes all those food metaphors, which is weird, but successfully alludes to the culinary arts. But going with his analogies, his ingredients are bad. He uses this creativity to encourage negative emotions and takes joy in the suffering that results. The Grim Heaper is the most fleshed out example, and since he actually creates art, the most straightforward one too. He creates, but only for himself, only based on a rigid set of rules that only he appreciates. Nothing about his work is meant to reach out to other people or ideas, which might be fulfilling for him, but doesn't do much in the game's philosophy of expanding your world through others. And well, we haven't talked about Miss Kanishi yet, but I can say without spoilers that she's a master of creatively using the game's rules to work around their spirit and abuse their letter to bend the laws and accomplish her goals. Creativity used to violate the spirit of the game and create unfair circumstances for other people. Little details like this all fit very neatly into the game's messaging, because in case this hasn't been established clearly enough yet, The World Ends With You is surprisingly dense and shockingly cohesive. Which is why I figured it was worth looking into some of the stuff that didn't really belong in the main summaries of the game. There's a lot going on in the edges of The World Ends With You that isn't necessary to understanding it, but does contribute to its overall meaning in ways that I think are rather effective and make the game a better work overall. So thanks for continuing this journey through one of my favorite RPGs. I'm going to try to get the last two episodes of this series out relatively quickly, so if you want to make sure you know when they come out, make sure to hit that subscribe button and the little bell next to it so YouTube will actually alert you to it. Because next time, we're going to be talking about Neku's third and final week in the game, and the conclusion to this story that we've been examining for all of these videos. So make sure to come back for that video and come get some hot stuff! that that <laughs> Good job. oh boy